Hello and welcome to Comics Over Time. This season, which we're calling Murdoch and Marvel, a history of Marvel Comics starring Daredevil, is our most ambitious project yet. Our plan is to look at the state of the comic book industry during a particular year, and then to examine in detail the major ways that Marvel Comics in particular evolved during that year. We'll look at who was creating comics, what new characters or storylines were introduced, and which comics either debuted or ended. After that, we'll get down to business, take out our stack of Daredevil comics, and look at what our old friend, the man without fear, was up to during that same time. We're glad you've joined us. My name is Dwayne, and with me, as always, my good buddy Dan. Dan, it is great to see you. It's been a few weeks. Sorry about that, but I am excited to be here to talk comics, a convention, all sorts of fun stuff tonight. Absolutely. It's, it is good to be back, man. I, uh, I had not realized how much I missed these until we're away a couple of weeks. And I know, hopefully right? Hopefully you listeners out there are also happy to have us back. Excited to come and uh, spend a little time here talking about an interesting year in comic books. So this is the week that Jim Shooter, for, for good or ill, begins to sort of start to steady the ship at Marvel, even while the distinguished competition kind of ends up falling apart. They're kneecapped by their corporate overlords. There's cancellations and problems. It's kind of a disaster. In the industry, prices go up and then prices go down. Great new companies come in and cool comics come out. Established companies end up publishing their last book and die. And as usual, we have a few of those predictions about the impending death of comic books and how within a few years they're not going to exist anymore. Welcome to 1978, everybody. <laughs> Wow, that sounds like we're going to have a lot to talk about. Before we jump in and talk about it, though, we did get some reader mail this over over the break. Absolutely, yeah. Got a nice letter from Zach Morris. Says he's been with us uh, all along. We've had a number of fans who've been with us for the long haul. Uh, folks like Zach, we really appreciate their uh, their being with us through all of this. He says, uh, I've been with you since the early Moon Knight days. Wanted to reach out before, but always uh, seemed to get distracted. Anyway, your Odyssey into Daredevil is my favorite format so far. I particularly love the historical approach you've taken. Love learning what was going on across comics as a whole during a given year. And enjoy pairing music that came out around the same time with comics as well. Perhaps some Beatles with Silver Age Fantastic Four, some spacey Pink Floyd to go with Lee Ditko Doctor Strange, or early R.E.M. with God Loves Man Kills. Which is a book we haven't gotten to talk about yet, by the way, Dwayne. Give, us, give yeah. us a few years here. Uh, so it's almost like a time machine. He also notes, I just got done listening to the 1977 episode, and you mentioned something about the letter pages no longer appearing in Marvel Unlimited. Not 100% certain, but my understanding is when Marvel publishes a book in the Marvel Masterworks line, they make sure to restore the letter pages as well in the book itself. That's probably why issues have letter pages, or some have letter pages and some don't. Just depends on whether they've already been included in the Marvel Masterworks. Thank you for putting the time and effort into your podcast. Makes long drives for work more enjoyable. Good luck with your move, Dwayne, and best to you both. So, really nice letter. Appreciate yes. you taking the time to send us that. Uh, and yeah, uh, we we have talked about this, Dwayne and I, a number of times. The the idea of going back and forth on more history, less history. Um, <laughs> Depending on how long your drive is, you might want us to do more history or you might want us to do less. We've been we've been having a trouble keeping it under like a half hour, even with me going with less history as we move along. But that is something that really did attract me to it. And so I'm still always fascinated by how culture and history move into it. So I, I will continue to sneak in as much history as I can. And then also, yeah, some, uh, we got a little bit of kiss last year. Haven't spent a whole lot of time on music, but that would that would be cool. We do we do a bit more with movies now as movies start to do comic booky things, but right. a little bit more with uh, with music would be excellent as well. So, no, I, I liked I liked that idea when I saw that in the message there. That that seems pretty sweet. There you go. So, and as far as the. The letters pages, I I think that what he says there makes a lot of sense. It probably is something to do with copyright, something to do with reprint rights, 
whatever. And maybe as mm-hmm. they as they finish off the the Marvel Masterworks things, they're getting all that stuff in the line and can put them in. But in any case, I would uh, I would really like it if more of the letter pages were there because. Again, from a historical standpoint, they're part of almost like that metadata of a comic book. When yeah. you read a comic that's actually still got all of its ad pages and its letter pages and its other things, it's a different experience. It kind of takes you more back into the time than reading it just as a, here's just the comic pages with nothing else. So, and then at the end, much much like Zach wanted to uh, hope your move has gone okay. Looks like you're settled in. And it must have gone well because you had time to go out and uh, start doing comic-related sort of uh, activities. Tell us a little bit about Fan Fusion and what you've been up to this last week. Yeah, so we did, my wife and I did go to Phoenix Fan Fusion. This is the second year we've gone. That is the big Phoenix uh, con uh, convention, comic book convention, movie geek all things geek basically uh and uh we we just basically took some time out of unloading or unpacking boxes and things like that to be able to go uh spent spent the saturday there like we did last year there were some some wonderful people that i wanted to see and it was very last minute i might i might also add that we did not think we were going to be able to go but then we decided that we were we thought we'd be able to because it happened over the Memorial Day weekend. So I we got to go. I got to meet uh, for 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 people who've been listening to the Daredevil podcast. I got to meet Marv Wolfman, uh, editor, writer uh, on the Daredevil comics for the seventies. It was uh, it was really great to see him. Told him how much I liked what he had done with with Daredevil and and that I. I loved some of the villains that he had brought to the character because some of the early char- villains, as we've talked about in the, uh, in the sixties and so not so great. And, um, I actually got a signed print of issue of a cover of issue 131, a issue with bullseye on the cover. First appearance and of bullseye. First appearance of bullseye. Yes. And, uh, so, so that was really neat. Uh, we've talked about it before. I'm a big fan of Undiscovered Country and Eight Billion Genies. The the writer for for that, Charles Sewell, was there, so I got some uh, autographs on my books for that. Got also uh, a picture from uh, our autograph on Eight Billion Genies from Ryan Brown, who was the artist uh, on the on the series, and so that was really cool. Uh, as far as like movies and stuff, I got an autograph from Giancarlo Esposito, who's now going to be in the MCU. It sounds like he's he's hinted at it. It's going to happen. We just don't know what character he's going to play as of yet. And uh, oh, what do you have there, Dan? This is my Ryan Brown original art page. Oh, with his huge, huge beaver head guy on it. Ryan Brown is go. just a goofball. He does crazy stuff. But I uh, I really enjoy. Ah, look at that! He did he did a little, a little uh, he did a little genie head on on mine there. Very cool. So that very was very cool neat. Indeed. Got some more Marvel uh, artwork to match some artwork I got last year of some of the various uh, Marvel characters that I really like: Captain America, Thor, and then a triple, a bigger version that has a Miles Morales a Peter Parker Spider-Man. So yeah, so I got a bunch of stuff, got to see, did not get to see as many panels as I was kind of hoping for because the line to get the uh, autograph from Giancarlo Esposito was quite long, but such is the way. It was a lot of fun and uh, yeah, I'm definitely immersing myself into the comic book culture now, as it were. Very, very cool. All right. So there we go. Good times. Thanks again to Zach for sending in the letter. Anybody else, of course, has anything they'd like to visit with us about or, or just stop by to say hi, we encourage that. And uh, and also get out to conventions if you can. It is a lot of fun. Dwayne's having fun with it. Uh, me and my family love them. They are increasingly fun for the whole family. So. Mm-hmm.
the year in comics. Okay, Dan, that introduction for 1978 sounded rather ominous, I guess would probably be the best word. We, we, we foreshadowed it in 1977. What is going on in the year in comics in 1978 that everyone should know about? Okay, so I'm going to start off with sort of non-comic book, or at least non-big two stuff. So let's okay. just take a look at kind of a little of that, what is going on in the world. The biggest thing in, in comic book news in 1978 is by far that the Superman movie is released. Oh, so this sure. This is the first Christopher yeah. Reeve movie, the one that we've had, like, you know, Neil Adams out working to get, uh, like, residuals and, and copyright stuff and everything for Siegel and Schuster and been kind of leveraging against DC because the movie's coming out. All the production problems that the Donners have had, uh, all of the... You know, they were going to make like a $10 million movie and ended up, and, and I think make two of them, and they ended up spending $50 million to make one or something. So <laughs> okay. it could have been a, a horrific bomb, but in actual fact, Christopher Reeve was the perfect casting, and him, Margot Kidder, Gene Hackman, all did really a great job. And it's become, I think, sort of pretty well accepted as one of the great comic book slash superhero movies of all time. Uh, it stands up as a lot of fun even if you watch it today so but that came out brought a lot of attention to comics interestingly didn't necessarily sell a lot of comic books but it brought up a lot of attention to the media and to the characters we also had some things like a superman um big trade that was superman versus muhammad ali came out it was by denny o'neill and neil adams the same guy that did uh, guys that did the green arrow green lantern stuff and everything it's a really interesting kind of goofy comic. The idea is Superman ends up on this on this planet. He is depowered and then has to fight Muhammad Ali with both of them not having powers. And it turns out that when you are used to not having to worry about taking a punch and you're fighting the guy who's the world champion, it's a, it's a little tough to outbox Muhammad Ali. So Superman kind of loses a little bit. Uh, it's it's a it's a weird kind of crazy comic. I've had one since I was a kid. Uh, they printed a bunch of them. So it's, it's a cool comic. Other things going on, uh, we had Watership Down and The Lord of the Rings come out in animated form. The Ralph Bakshi Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, uh, sort of the where there's a whip, there's a way type of thing from the, the animated cartoon songs and the like is something I loved as a kid. We also had probably one of the worst comic book adaptations ever. Uh, Doctor Strange came out this year as what? a TV movie, and it I was don't, I don't know awful. that I know this. So I put a link into the archive.org copy of the movie. So if and, and this should I, have I'll, like a a content warning on it just for <laughs> just for awful, right? But this was actually yeah like a, a two hour movie of the week type movie. Doctor Strange is not a doctor now; he's a psychologist. They change a bunch of other stuff unnecessarily. The actor actually isn't that bad, but just everything else about it is bad. So huh. this was an adaptation that didn't work. But this was when Marvel was getting a bunch of stuff on. You know, the Hulk series was still going. Spider-Man series was still going, so they tried Doctor Strange as well. This one did not did not go at all. Well, that, would news, that, would, that would explain why I've never heard of it before. No. This is one of those that got buried, and it's not quite as bad as, like, the, you know, Star Wars holiday special. But it's I was going to say, it's, it's in it's that area. That, it's, it's not that infamous. It's, it just was, like, no. la landed just with a thud and then got forgotten. Yeah, okay. Just better forgotten. Yep. Uh, in the newspapers, we have one big strip, Garfield, one of my favorite strips as a kid that debuts yep. in 1978. Also, we got new newspaper strips for the Hulk for Conan the Barbarian, and for one called The World's Greatest Superheroes, which is pretty much just DC's JLA, Justice League, uh, in a kind of rotating strip. So what's interesting is everywhere in America, it seems, there's more and more interest in superheroes and in comics, except we're going to find out in comics. <laughs> so it's that a little weird. weird. That is weird. <laughs> But we'll get back to that. 
other things that are going on outside of Marvel and DC Comics themselves, one of the most important independent books of the 70s and 80s debuts, um, Warp Graphics, which stands for Wendy and Richard Peeney Graphics, uh, debuts ElfQuest. Uh, it starts in Fantasy Quarterly number one, published by somebody else. That publisher sort of goes bare, belly up, and the Peenies have to... Basically, there's a story of like this odyssey where Richard has to drive halfway across the country to get his art back so that they can continue publishing, um, or to get Wendy's art back, so they can continue publishing ElfQuest. Uh, and then they, with number two, sort of self-publish it themselves. But oh. ElfQuest is going to go on to be just a title that sort of is revolutionary in its audience and in the way that it's published. So these two kind of do everything themselves. Essentially, Wendy writes and draws the book. Richard is the distribution and production arm and everything else. And the interesting element of it, as far as the, the audience, is that it's one of the few books of this time where the audience was more than half female. So it was one of, the, one of those early comics in the direct market that pulled in a substantial female audience. Baronet Books actually published in bookstores, A Contract with God by Will Eisner. Um, this is not the first graphic novel. There's all sorts of people who claim what the first graphic novel is. But this is one that sometimes had that title. Not because it was actually the first, essentially, comic book published as a, as a book, but because mm -hmm. it was the first that really tried to have what you what you almost look at as like ambitions for the media, the, the comics medium, within a literary context. Oh, okay. And I have increasingly become sort of cynical about that idea that comics need to grow up and become, you know, like their big older brother, the regular novel, right? Right. But but I think at this time that was something that Will Neisner was strongly trying to do. He wanted to get comics to be an acceptable art form for adults and for sort of serious storytelling that didn't necessarily involve resolution through violence and the like. So Contract with God was really a, a number of short stories just about a bunch of people living in a tenement in New York. Huh. So. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, Eclipse Comics published Saber, Slow Fade of an Endangered Species by Don McGregor Gregor and uh, Paul Lacey. I actually took out my Saber uh, graphic. I've got a copy of this from 78 uh, and reread it. It is so serious. It is like the most serious of all the pumpkins in the pumpkin patch. And <laughs> it's obvious that Glacey really wanted to make something that had, you know, flowery language and more more adult themes and everything else but it's okay. also a little bit weird because you have saber and his his girlfriend who essentially stop to have sex in the courtyard while they're attempting to invade a castle and free their friends and it's like this is weird right that is weird so maybe quite literally you know just a, a a little unnecessary addition to the story but they, uh, they did a great job. Glacey's art is always beautiful. So this was by Eclipse Comics. It's Eclipse Comics' first publication, essentially. Really, this is what phones Eclipse. And huh. Eclipse Comics is going to go on over the next nearly decade to do a lot of really good stuff, both in terms of graphic novel type things and comic books within the direct market. So... Uh, it's actually a pretty pretty important player, and uh, this is their first their first time into the market was this year. Uh, we also have the last title by the underground publisher called Printment. Um, it was called Let Me Out of Here, Growing Up Inside the American Dream by Diane Newman, who's a, a cartoonist who'd done quite a lot of work within the underground space over the years. Um, and this is kind of... What we're seeing is this end of the, the sort of actual underground publishers, really. And more and more we're starting to see the independent publishers that are looking to be a little less outright um, sort of rebellious slash offensive and more and more just trying to fill that, that space of making comic books that are a little bit more 
uh, edgy than what the, the Comics Code Authority would allow, but not so edgy that they get the comic book shop owners arrested on pornography charges, right? Sure, Somewhere sure, in that sure. happy medium there. Right? Okay. There's probably so, there's probably some wiggle room in between those two was, ends. There. there was quite a lot of space there. But yeah, the, yeah, because the thing is, in the in the direct market, almost none of this stuff is, of course, using the Comics Code Authority. If it doesn't need to go on the newsstand, they don't need to worry about giving it to the code, because the reason you have the code, really, is because otherwise, a lot of times, the news seller wouldn't want to put that book onto the stand, have a parent come in and find something objectionable, and then yell at them. So right. essentially, that code was a the stamp of approval, um, was a promise to the retailer they weren't going to get yelled at by parents. So, we also did see a few of these that try to do kind of that in-between and fail. One of them is 1984 by Warren Publishing. It actually tries to follow in the success of Heavy Metal from last year. Heavy Metal came out in 77, almost right. immediately starts reprinting or uh, like, like really good European stuff or bringing some of those European artists or better American artists in to do stuff. 1984 by Warren, who'd been doing Vampirella and a bunch of other stuff already on the newsstands and the like in the horror market and, and things like this, tries to follow that, but it ends up being actually just bad. Not only bad, but derivative. And worse than that, uh, as one person, uh, Richard Arndt, described it, it was juvenile, sleazy, scatological, racist, demeaning to women, heavy-handed in its treatment of violence, and lame in its sense of humor. So, Ouch. And, and if that wasn't bad enough, they also then, the next year, added plagiarism to that list by stealing one of Harless Nellison's song um, stories, just barely disguising it enough they thought they could get wit or got away with it, end up getting sued oh, by Harlan gosh. Ellison, and he essentially ends the magazine. Wow. Which I think was better for all of us anyways. All right, so so what about trends for this year? I, I mean, we talked a little bit about DC, but like there were some big things that were going on at DC that really kind of hit here. So Jeanette Kahn, at the end of 1977, announced the DC explosion, which was going to be this new raft of titles that they were going to bring out to sort of reinvigorate the DC universe. As part of that... They wanted to increase the page count from the 17 pages that they were at previously back up to 25, because every time it seemed that the price went up in comics, a few pages less were there too. So comic stories had been getting shorter and shorter. She's like, you can't tell a decent story with 17 pages. We're going back up to 25. And she raised the price from 35 cents to 50 cents, which is a substantial hike Ooh. again. And you've been noticing like every year we're getting yeah. a price increase, right? Right about the time they decided to do this, and they announced something like 15 new books, there had been, if you remember the previous year, a lot of things going on with economic problems in America. Yeah. And DC's parent company, the corporation, looked and said, you guys are losing all sorts of money. We want you to slash titles and we're going to have you cancel a bunch of stuff. And so, oh gosh. just as they're trying to expand and starting to publish more, they're instead told that they need to cut a bunch. And over the next six to eight months in 1978, what's now come to be known as the DC implosion, sees the DC actually cancel over a dozen titles by the end of the year, plus scrapping additional titles before they were even released. The total damage ends up being 31 books that were either canceled or wow. were announced and never actually published. Wow. That is... That's a lot. That is, that is a lot. So they also, then halfway through the year, after going to 25 pages and 50 cents, immediately went back down to 17 pages and back down to 40 cents. <laughs> so... So not this, even back, not even back to the thirty-five cents they were. No, nope. they they went back to forty cents, but we're giving you the pages that you were buying yes. the thirty-five cents for previously. Which oddly is exactly what Marvel did back in the day as well, where they increased the pages and the 
the price and then they roll back the price but don't roll it back all the way and they roll the page count back all the way oh geez. so essentially it's like a a secret you know they they bump the price up way high and give you a little something then they take away what they gave you put it back down seems like you're saving money but in the end <laughs> no the kids were getting screwed yep yep um at this point with the poor sales from the previous year and the fact that they then ended up doing significant staff cuts both in terms of freelancers and in terms of actual staff at dc morale went completely in the toilet and we even had rumors at this point that dc would follow charlton's lead and stop publishing new comics at all and simply end up going back to like reprints of old batman superman and wonder woman stories that they had an in inventory from the 60s and 70s so as part of this one of the uh one of the the sort of folks who was watching the industry at the time mike gold predicted that the 32 page comic will be extinct in five years essentially the pamphlet that it right. just is not a market that can ever work the number of times we've heard <laughs> that the comic book in its its pamphlet format is going to be extinct within a couple of years is just astonishing but this was a bad time for DC. There's no question. Sure. Um, outside of that, though, there are good things. San Diego Comic Con hits 5,000 attendees for the first time. Um, Edwina Dumb is the first female comic artist to get the Gold Key Award from the National Cartoonist Society. And we do have Neil Adams, through all of this craziness going on, tried to organize a comic book creators guild, sort of in response to some new copyright verbiage Marvel and DC are forcing on their workers. Now this is not Marvel and DC's doing, it's actually because Congress changed copyright law in 1976 to go into effect in 1978. And so um. in order to make sure that they actually would continue to have rights to the stuff that people produced for them in a, in an ad, um, a work for hire capacity, Marvel and DC needed to get these new documents signed. Nobody liked it, though, because everybody was mad about not getting any kind of real royalties and, or the like off their stuff anyways. Unfortunately, this new Comic Creators Guild, they had a meeting, and I think there were two main problems that they had. The first one is that Adams decided to say the Comic Creators Guild would only support the creators, which means writers, pencilers, and inkers, because colorists and letterers were not actually creatives, and because of that, he didn't want them to be part of the union. Ouch. In a lifetime of being a pretty bright guy, this is one of the dumbest things he ever did. Because obviously, the more he could have expanded the group, and in fact, a number of people even told him this, the better off they'd be. Also, it was just a tough time in the industry to start trying to make demands on companies when people are talking about everything just failing. Right. So, but, so yet again, the, uh, the unionization efforts fail relatively quickly. So did we have any... That, oh, go ahead. So did we have any awards or anything like that in 1978? Yeah. I, uh... yeah, it was the Eagle Awards, and this was a really good year for Marvel. It was mostly X-Men and Avengers books. DC stumbled. And because it was like the comic buyer's guide or some of these things, you know, where people could vote, uh, all those kids buying millions of Archie and Richie Rich comics did not get to vote or even know the awards existed. So yeah. they, they do not get any uh, any nominations. But yeah, it was, it was Claremont, Byrne, Austin, you know, the X-Men gang. Micronauts was actually named as the best new title, which is weird because we won't talk about that till next year because it actually is cover dated January 1979. So in our way of thinking, it's not actually a 1978 comic. And then the Korvac saga, which was a story going on in Avengers this year, was actually another one that was uh, kind of celebrated as one of the better things of the year. So almost all of the uh, almost all of the awards went to Marvel this year. All right. Well, I guess if they're going to get all the awards and they're not imploding like DC is. Maybe we should talk about what happened at Marvel this year. The year in Marvel. Excelsior. All right, Dan, 1978. 
DC's imploding, and we've got some some books, some companies that are dying. We've got all these, you know, Archie and Richie Rich books that are still going on. But what's going on at Marvel? Why they they got a bunch of awards, so they must be doing something right. Yeah, well, and and as usual, they continue to just shovel books onto the shelves, thus That's making sure, sure that basically nobody else has the ability to sell anything. But yeah, they did. They had a bunch of good stuff. We already talked about the Korvac Saga. That was by Jim Shooter, George Perez. Really a good story. I think it also, though, exemplifies a lot of what is going on at Marvel at this time. And this is even though Shooter is trying to get everything on schedule, he can't even keep himself on schedule. Because oh, this no. book is another one that not only has to have fill-in writers, fill-in artists, they actually have one entire issue that just says, hey, yeah, we'll be back with the Korvac storyline next week. Enjoy this complete, unrelated fill-in issue. Because oh. they just ran low, right? Couldn't get the stuff in in time. There's even a rumor that one of the issues, Jim Shooter colored it himself overnight because the pages came in so late that they couldn't get a regular colorist to do it, and he had to actually just do the job to get it to the printer. So oh gosh! I'm going to track that one down. Actually, see if see if that's actually something he admitted to. But um, other than that, though, there's things going on. Uh, Micklin and Layton take over the Iron Man title, which had been slated for cancellation. And as it was going to be canceled, Shooter's like, "Hey, you guys, can you fill in for a few issues before we, you know, take Iron Man out behind the shed and shoot it?" And they did. And it turns out best thing they'd ever done because that turns <laughs> iron man around right sure. he, he's not canceled for 20 years or whatever um simon and schuster actually published the silver surfer graphic novel this is the final stan lee jack kirby collaboration it's a retelling and reimagining of the silver surfer's story so it's not the same as the story in fantastic four in fact oh. it's essentially that story without the fantastic four in it oh um yeah, last time those two worked together, uh, this is the first Marvel graphic novel, the first actual made for sure. the direct market, made for you know bookstore market, uh, in independent uh, new content. So, do you, do you know how it did? Did it do? Did it do okay? Relatively well, yeah. I don't. It didn't set the world on fire, but it made a little money. We're going to talk about some of the Lee Kirby or or just Kirby stuff and and. One of the interesting elements of that in a minute. Um, okay. Ms. Marvel changes costume this year. She goes from her original costume to the sort of black, um, like, uh, one-piece bathing suit with the big red sash that becomes her, her outfit for the next probably 15, 20 years. FF hits issue number 200, which is a big celebration for them. They bring back a bunch of characters and everything. And then Kirby actually does a what-if issue that draws the original Marvel bullpen as the Fantastic Four. So he's the thing, and Stan is Mr. Fantastic, and... Oh, my. Uh, et cetera. So, yeah. I think it's uh, I think it's Sal Brodsky and Flo Stein, Steinberg are the, uh, are the other two. Are the so, other two? Yeah. It's a kind of a, a tongue-in-cheek is, type of thing. Is that in Marvel Unlimited? Do we have the ability to see that? I would bet it is, yeah. So. Yeah, I'll have to look for that because I'm curious. I want to see what that looked like. And yet again, by the way, um, as this one's done, Kirby was kind of having fun with it. They ended up changing all of his dialogue, ticked him off, and it became yet another one of the reasons why he didn't re-sign his contract. Oh, no. So, yet another of the uh, of the things going bad in the in the land of Marvel and Kirby. So... Plus which, and I, I don't want to make it sound too good, yes, they're not DC, where everything's completely falling apart. But again, after sales decreases from 76 to 77, Marvel suffered another overall 8% decline in sales from 1977 to 1978. What's interesting is they're still putting out colossal numbers of titles, 85 different titles, uh, I went in and looked in my comics.org database. I saw 646 total comics that would have been available to the direct market. Mainstream, independent, underground, everything. A lot of those would have been 
maybe only one issue or they would have been you know like a uh, a collection of peanut strips or something so sure. in terms of the actual comic books put out just a massive percentage of them were marvel books at this point and so they're declining in sales and that's bad because they are more and more of the overall market of the comic book industry so right. when they're declining everybody's declining yeah or, or definitely looks like it because they have such a large percentage of the books that they're that they're putting out. It looks like it, and it is it. Yeah, in actual fact, even sure. the Archies and the others are doing well, but a lot of those even are talking about you know they used to have a million or seven hundred thousand copies. Now they've got seventy thousand copies or one hundred and fifty thousand copies. So it's a it's a huge difference in terms of uh, of sales right now. So, did they do any new books then? As far Absolutely. as this big eighty-five titles, what what was what was new in so nineteen seventy-eight? It's not much. There's actually only four new titles: Devil Dinosaur and Machine Man, both of which are Jack Kirby books. So even okay. as he's rolling along, Jack Kirby continues to just make new characters. Uh, Stan asked him to make a character that could be turned into a Saturday morning TV show. So he makes a big red dinosaur. And, and in fact, now, uh, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur has become one of the more popular books for sort of tween age Marvel fans, kind of a gateway yeah. to Marvel for them over the last while. So they've and, started to get that taken care of. And, and they're now doing an a, uh, animated show on Disney Plus, uh, Devil, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur as well. Really? Yeah. You go... You go, Jack Kirby. Look at him. Yeah. He's, he's got it figured out. So, um, Machine Man, again, one of my favorite characters. He is hes somebody who came around from uh, basically back in the day in uh, the 2001 Space Odyssey books that Kirby had done. Man from Atlantis is an adaptation of the Patrick Duffy TV show. And Spider Woman is the first issue of the Spider Woman title coming out of her introduction last year. Okay. After that, Rampaging Hulk is renamed to the Hulk, and Power Name is renamed or Power Man is renamed to Power Man and Iron Fist, and that's really it for new stuff. Oh, so. yeah, that is that is not a huge list of new things. Like we, we've seen some pretty large amounts of titles. Even if there was reprints, there was still it seemed like a lot of new titles that were coming out that had at least some new content into in addition to some reprints. Well, so if we don't have a ton of new stuff, do we have new characters in the existing stuff? Did, did we get any new big name heroes or villains that that, uh, that that took the Marvel Universe by storm? Meh. I, I would say no in terms <laughs> of overall. So there's characters okay. who definitely matter, characters who've been important in the, in the movies and the like, TV, uh -huh. but not really big top names so sure you've got mystique who is probably the biggest name everybody would know uh, she right. actually debuted as a ms marvel villain and has since gone on to be an x-men and everything else and so that's a character a lot of people know weapon alpha who's also been renamed vindicator and then guardian was from uh, alpha flight uh, which is a book i really enjoyed back in the day so i like that character but that's not an a-list by any means Quasar, they've constantly tried to make Quasar work, and he's never really, never really gotten there. Uh, Arcade is a a villain. Captain Britain is uh, in his first appearance in America this year. The character appeared in in Marvel UK before, but hadn't appeared in in American Marvel books. We do right. get one one very important Daredevil edition. In Ben Yurick, who's going to be yes. an incredibly important part of the uh, the cast on the TV show, but then also of the the comic books, he's a, a fundamental part of Daredevil's universe for the last thirty years. Not only Daredevil, but he was he was one of the viewpoints that we saw when we did the Civil War book, yep. that special book that we saw the two sides of Civil War through reporters, and Ben Yurick was one of the one of the two reporters that yep. basically switched kind of his thought process and allegiance be 
over the course of that book. Absolutely. Yep. So he's he's been around a long time. Very, very big part of the Marvel Universe. Bethany Cabe, we're going to see a bit of her over in Iron Man. And then, of course, you got Devil Dinosaur and Moon Boy. Uh, originally it was Moon Boy, now it's Moon Girl, so they did change that in the in the modern books. Um, Moonstone, the second Moonstone came out this year, and then we've got people like Kyber and Baraco and eh, not really a whole lot else. So I would say this is a I low end yeah, the I was creative say, side. I don't really know any of, any of those last few you mentioned <laughs> there, if I'm being honest. Hypno Hustler? Could I interest you in some hip Hypno Hustler? So, no, no yeah, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. What? So, uh, did they? They must have canceled a few books this year as well. Yes. Right? Yep. So uh, we lost Devil Dinosaur. We we barely knew him, right? So started and ended. What nine issues? Uh, the Eternals ended. That's another Jack Kirby book. Cole the Destroyer ended, Marvel Comics Classic, or Classic Comics ended, and in an irony that may make Zach regret he'd ever asked for music tie-ins, while We Are the Champions by Queen was one of the top ten songs in America this year, the champions with Hercules are no longer the champions as of now because they're canceled with issue 17. And I like the champions, so that makes me sad. I've heard of the song, I can't say that I've heard of the, the, the champions, the comic book. Yeah, it's uh, like a C-list super team, but it was it was a lot of fun. It was Hercules, right. Black Widow, a bunch of those sorts of folks were in it. Okay. All right. So, what is what does the bullpen look like here? I know editor in chief is going to be Jim Shooter, but yep. like, what what are we? Who are the big creators this year? Is there? And, and I guess. Leading into the Rookie of the Year, who, who are some of the new people? So the staff size this year is catastrophic. There are 207 people credited with working on Marvel Comics this year. I don't know how they possibly kept all of that. Like, you know. 207? Yeah, it's a lot. You know, previously, most years, even just a little while ago, we were, we were maybe over 100 but generally not even that high. And now we've we've cleared 200 people working on books this wow. year. And they had, you know, 85 titles and everything. Now, a lot of them were bi-monthly, like Daredevil, we're going to find. They cut yeah. it down to only six. So there's probably about half of those books my, that uh, Marvel has in are, are bi-monthly at this point. So they would be published, and then the idea was that by being bi-monthly, they could have more books on the shelves because Daredevil will be published in January and then stay on the shelf even as another book comes out in February and right. so you double everything up. So yeah, it was they were crazy. Anyway, five five writers still had their own worlds. Gerber, Goodwin, Kirby, Thomas, and Wolfman still edited themselves. Shooter hated this, but evidently there were things like corruption he had to deal with and other sorts of things like there were people stealing from the company that he's oh finding out about and and all sorts of stuff so his first year just everything's on fire and so he's trying to deal with that first so all these guys mostly make it through except steve gerber actually not only was still editing himself but he kept missing all his deadlines and he got mo removed from the howard the duck um newspaper strip because of it, got angry and threatened to sue, then got himself removed from the Howard the Duck regular comic book as well, and ended up... Oh, God. Him. Now, he did come back as a, a freelancer, and Shooter says he's like, you know, one of the best writers I know, but the problem is he just couldn't depend on him. So I think Shooter was more like, sure. I'll, I'll agree to publish stuff once I know you've written it, right? So... Yeah. Kind of unfortunate... But Gerber was somebody who really, in many ways, defined kind of the edgy, best style of Marvel Comics in the 70s. And so having him kind of pulled from his own primary book, Howard the Duck, was sad. There is a, a book called Marvel Comics in the 70s by Elliot Bornstein that talks about kind of that, that jaded idealist that is Steve Gerber and how him and Howard the Duck were kind of the same guy. 
and <laughs> it, okay. uh, it it was a lot of fun. But but yeah, so Gerber's going to be gone, and Jack Kirby leaves Marvel again. His three year contract was up. He does not resign. He leaves to go off and work in animation out in California, where he's already living. Kirby actually at this point called the Marvel bullpen a serpent's nest, where basically everybody is trying to get everybody else. There are even, uh-huh. Shooter actually confirmed that there were editors who had, like were openly mocking Kirby's artwork and his work. They would have little things on the wall kind of making fun of him. And oh, they no. also evidently, he, he, he said that there were times actually where the editors would have sock puppet accounts essentially where they would write in letters di- like dissing other people's books to try and get them fired so that then they could take oh, over their God. jobs. Oh God. So these guys were just Marvel this was a mess right now. Yikes. I mean and and so again I I've heard for a long time that Jim Shooter was really a pain in the butt to work for. But when if you this look is at what where he had you're to deal with from yeah oh my God. And, <laughs> And he's 26 years old. Can you imagine being 26 years old and having to come in and take over this? Yeah, A lot of these guys are old, like way older than him. He's always been used to being the young guy. But right. even so, I mean, it's it's just crazy. So Papers. Kirby leaves. Um, we have our top creators of the year now change a little. Mark Evanier. Marv Wolfman, Roy Thomas, Bill Mantlo, and Chris Claremont are our top writers. Uh, Sal Buscema, Carmen Infantino, who's going to do a lot of the stuff on Daredevil this week. Uh, Jack Kirby, Dick Bickenbach, and John Buscema are our top pencilers. To show you how weird this year is, I don't know who Dick Bickenbach is. I assume that probably <laughs> that's on maybe one of the Hanna-Barbera books or something like this. I, I literally don't know this guy. Um, Esposito, Prince, Spiegel as top inkers. Uh, Carl Gafford, George Russos, Janice Cohen, top colorists. And then letters, we've got Gaspar Saladino, John Costanza, Mike Royer, uh, Joe Rosen. Uh, sort of some of the, the regular crew there. So it's a, it's a crazy time. There are so many people. And, you know, books are coming out haphazardly. Deadlines are being missed. I think when we read the Daredevils this week, you can get, if you look even a little bit into the credit box or behind the scenes, just how jumbled up things are because it's a disconnected year in Daredevil as well. You know? Yeah. It's kind of yeah. crazy. All right. Let's talk about Rookie of the Year. Tell me that there is a glimmer of hope as far as the creators go that there's going to be somebody big and impactful that's coming that we're that we're just waiting for someone someone who'll change everything redefine the way comics are done and perhaps change the fates of two of the biggest characters for marvel and dc forever it's possible perhaps that that guy might be debuting maybe, this year. Maybe, so. maybe, maybe we should talk about some of the uh, also rans then before talking about that no. individual in particular. Yeah. Really, it's pretty clear this week because we've got some really good people. Tom DeFalco worked on a lot of licensed properties over the years for Marvel. Bob Sharon was a longtime colorist who worked on pretty much all their books for a long time. He, in many ways, defined sort of a lot of the colors for a number of years. Gene Day uh, came in, worked on Master of Kung Fu, was universally lauded as one of the best artists, one of the best young artists in comics. And unfortunately, he died at age 31 of like a cardiac arrest. Um, He's in the Canadian Art Hall of Fame. There's a Gene Day Award established. Uh, All sorts of people have said that he was a great person to work with. And Dave Sim of Cerebus called him a mentor to him. So massive loss to the industry. And this is a guy whose career would have obviously gone on a lot longer and been far more impactful. Um, Mark Grenwald, who is one of the craziest stories in comics, he also uh, ended up dying young at 43 of a heart attack. He had been working for a long time as an editor and writer at Marvel and has the odd distinction. Do you remember last year we talked about Kiss 
going to the printers and putting their blood into the ink for the first printing of the KISS trade paperback. Uh, Mark Grenwald mm -hmm. had literally told his family and his wife and all the people he worked with that one of the things he really wanted when he died, and I'm sure he thought this was going to be a lot farther along, was that he loved comic books and he wanted to be a part of comics forever. So he wanted to be, like, cremated and then put into the ink of a comic book. Uh. And they did it. So his wife, because he had, he had his will actually set up and, and everything, she executed the will the way he asked. When he died, they cremated him, and he was put into the printing ink for the first printing of the Squadron Supreme trade paperback that came out a year or so after he died. So there is actually, if you go out on eBay, you can you can actually find and bid on the the Squadron Supreme first printing Grenwald ink copies. Oh no! If you if you That's, literally want a piece is, of Mark Grenwald, that is morbid. That's kind of crazy, but that, that is uh, really that morbid. Him. That was him. So. Uh, <laughs> Please, Which it's please, hard to be more dedicated to Tell me to there's somebody else. That, please, right? please go. <laughs> go to somebody else. I love else Mark Reynolds stuff. God. His his Squadron Supreme was really good. David McLeany uh, helped Recognize create an entire that, yeah. part of the Marvel Universe. Yeah. Because he is the guy who co-created Venom and Carnage. So now the whole Venomverse basically comes out of his, uh, his creating of them. He was the guy who created Scott Lang in Iron Man to uh, kind of first as a scientist. Um, he also created War Machine, or co-created. So he's got quite a list of characters, yeah. many of them Iron Man related. Him and Bob Layton wrote the Demon in a Bottle story. Yeah. And only Stan Lee had a longer run on Amazing Spider-Man as a writer than Dave Mc David McLean. So, he is not a bad choice. He would no. have been a perfectly reasonable Rookie of the Year. Yeah. If it weren't for the fact that Frank Miller made his first comic book for Marvel. Uh, uh, yes. As I have in my notes, he's Frank <laughs> Miller. I don't really know what else to say about this. Miller not only has a fantastic run on Daredevil, but he then goes over to DC and he does Ronin and sets his own terms in terms of printing and how things are going to be done and what's going to be allowed for him in terms of his contract and everything else and sort of changes the industry that way. Then he does Dark Knight and sort of flips everything on its on its ear there. Then he goes off and does all of his own stuff with the, the Martha Washington books and Sin City. Then he goes off to Hollywood and ends up making some of these movies that really draw a little attention back to it. And all the time he's coming back and doing things like Batman Year One for DC and more stories with, like, um, David Mazzuccelli on Daredevil. I have a conflicted relationship with Frank Miller about some of his late stuff. I love The Spirit by Will Eisner, and I think that The Spirit by Frank Miller is one of the worst movies ever made. So there are times where he has misses, right? But uh -huh. overall, when you look at his history of redefining characters for a new generation, when you look at the stuff he did for creator rights, when you do look at some of the stuff he does in terms of working with uh, like the comic book defense fund and things like this, is just a really important guy in the history of comics and a fantastically important guy in the history of Marvel, primarily yeah. because of what he did with Daredevil. Because he's the one that takes Daredevil from being a guy who's had a pretty decent run in Marvel Comics, but I don't think anybody could say was really, you know, what, what, what's been memorable about the first 160 issues of Daredevil? I, uh, not a lot. I mean, like... Him he, and Foggy have a lot of girl troubles, and he's yeah. got a bunch of crappy villains, right? Yeah, yeah, like, there, there's nothing that I would say that is, like... There's some interesting stuff that happens, but nothing that I would categorize as being, uh, you know, unexpected. Like, or or like, you could you could put a different character in there, and it would be 
virtually the same. And even if not, I mean, he is unique because of the blindness aspect and how that affects his plots. But there's, as far as a defining storyline or something yeah. that really would grab people, he doesn't have a demon in the bottle. Sure. I mean, technically, sure. Iron Man doesn't have a demon in the bottle yet either. So I guess, you know, touche on go. that. But yeah. nonetheless, these things are coming for them. Frank Miller takes Daredevil from being a character to being a character that really just has meat to him. And he, he gives him his religion, he gives him Electra, he gives him Bullseye, he gives him the Kingpin. He gives him this whole world that just wasn't there before. And so, yeah. yeah. I, when, when I started talking about reading comics, uh, one of the things that I was told was I needed to read Frank Miller Daredevil. And yep. I, we're, we're not there yet. We will start getting there next week. But I, I, I'm telling you that I was really looking forward to when I finally saw a Frank Miller book. And he did not disappoint in his first, in a, at, right, right from the get-go. And we were talking before the recording. You get into the early 80s. And there is some really, really cool stuff there. So we've got a yep. lot of great things to talk about with regards to Daredevil. Now, yeah. you know, in the in the upcoming years because of Frank Miller. And we could probably just declare him the rookie of the year and move on, because I suspect we will we will visit his name yes. will be mentioned again yes. on this podcast at some point, probably. That is so. that is true. The year in Daredevil. All right, Dwayne. So, here we go. We have made it to the man himself. It is time to talk about an, a truncated and kind of all over there season of Daredevil in 1978. What, uh, what do you got for us? And then what did you think of this year? Yeah, so it is, it is weird. Like, I, I didn't realize they were kind of going to this, this bi-monthly situation, but we only have six issues in the main Daredevil run. It is 150 to 155. He makes an appearance in Marvel 2-in-1, 37, 38, and 39. Human Fly, issue number nine. He also was in Thor, number 271. Marvel Team-Up, number 73. And Fantastic Four, annual number 13. We're not going to talk about all of those, all right? We're going to talk about the main Daredevil run. We're going to talk about the Marvel 2-in-1 as kind of the main places that he showed up at for the year. As far as writing goes, we had Jim Shooter was on issue 150. We had a triple threat of Roger McKenzie, Jim Shooter, and Gil Kane that wrote issue 151. And then Roger McKenzie took over and did 152 to 155. As far as pencilers go throughout this year, we had Carmen Infantino that did issues 150 and 152. Gil Kane did 151, which makes sense because he was part of the writing credits there as well. We had a return of Gene Colan, actually, who did 153 and 154. And the year ended on the main run with Frank Robbins as the penciler for issue 155 so lots of different people had a hand in daredevil this year and i'm going to be honest it you could kind of tell it, it was it was not the best year as far as stories go uh for for our friend matt murdoch but if you're looking at the year the year begins with daredevil looking for kilgrave who who uh you know was was mm -hmm. the big villain at the end of 1977. Meanwhile, another of New York's elite that was manipulated by Kilgrave hires the Paladin to hunt down Kilgrave as well. So we have this other I don't I'm not calling him a, a villain or an antagonist necessarily, but they do meet, they fight, but then they sort of just kind of part ways kind of yeah. agreeing to just sort of like we're both going for the same guy we're both gonna get the guy you're not gonna get the guy but i'm not gonna like do anything to you right now about it so yeah there we go 
and it, and it was weird because like they kind of build this paladin as being like somebody that was really important as we were as we were going into 1978 the last issue in 1977 and it was a bit of an underwhelming sort of sort of introduction to the paladin if i if i'm being perfectly honest yep so next up we have after a bad dream murdoch decides to come clean to heather glenn about his daredevil secret and tells her that maxwell glenn was in fact innocent and that he was working to find the person responsible. While waiting for Heather to come home, he answers the phone and learns that Maxwell Glenn has committed suicide in prison. When she arrives, he still comes clean, and Heather blames Daredevil and Matt for everything, including Maxwell Glenn's death. And then she kicks him out of the apartment and then disappears, like leaving town, presumably. So... This was a. It was a. It was a, actually a pretty good story, but kind of an extra gut punch there because, like, we've seen him divulge this secret before to Karen Page. That didn't go particularly well. He does it again to Heather Glenn, who he he seemingly loves as much as Matt Murdock can love somebody. It seems. And and again, it sort of backfires on him. So, yeah, not 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 great. I, you feel for Matt a little bit, but at the same time, you totally understand where she's coming from. She's like, you weren't there for me. You knew what was going on. You knew he was innocent. You still brought him to jail, got him arrested, and and he didn't have a way out. So he's in prison and he commits suicide. This is your fault, basically. And it, it's 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 a good story. It's a tough story to read, but it also it, it it was probably the like as far as a story goes, kind of the high point of the year. If I'm if I'm being perfectly honest, in that it was the best story of the year. You know, I I was one problem I had is is the pencilers changing as wildly as they did really caused me trouble because Infantino yeah. and Kane and Colin and Robbins are not the same guy. Similar, not similar even really. And you've got kind of, you know, a lot of the times the inkers are staying the same on some of these and the like, but, but really Infantino and, and this is, I've never been a big Carmen Infantino fan. He was, he was really good back in the sixties but by the 70s and 80s, uh, he had not been doing a lot of penciling regularly. And so he took over like the Flash again for DC in a couple of years here. And I was reading all of those because I loved the backup story with Dr. Fate. But I wasn't a big fan of the, the Infantino stories. So I think the art got in the way on some of these for me too. I don't sure. Know. Okay. So... As, as we move forward, knowing he can't fix his relationship with Heather, Daredevil orchestrates an intervention slash meetup between Deborah Harris and Foggy Nelson in Central Park, which leads to them deciding that they're once again going to get married. Uh, while in Central Park, though, Daredevil has another run-in with the Paladin, who, again, is still looking for Kilgrave. And, yeah, again, not really much of a thing it was it was just sort of they got they they met they see each other they there's a little bit of a tussle if i remember right but not really anything and then they just sort of part ways again so it's it's not really that much of a to do i guess next daredevil's lure daredevil's lured into a trap with heather glenn as the bait by mr hyde and cobra we have mr hyde and cobra have made a return after a lengthy battle that includes the Billy Club getting destroyed yet again and Hyde and Daredevil falling from a 12th floor window uh, of Glenn's apartment complex, Daredevil is captured. So we have this. It, it's weird. I, I was not expecting, you know, we've had run ins with the Paladin. We know he's looking for Kilgrave. We know this Heather Glenn situation is not great, but 
I was not expecting Mr. Hyde and Cobra, and they just all of a sudden sort of appear, and you're like, what the heck did these two have to do with anything that's going on? They're a big fight. It, it's mainly a book of just them fighting. And then they fall, fall out a window, and then Daredevil gets captured. So you're like, okay, I don't know what this has to do with anything that's kind of going on right now, but all right. Well, nope. this leads to an epic showdown in which Daredevil must take on the Jester, Gladiator, Hyde, Cobra, and briefly the Paladin, who is under the influence of Kilgrave. So, hey, there we go. That's why those guys were there. This is going to be our spotlight story for the week, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about it, but we do get a resolution for the Kilgrave story as much as you get a resolution to a story in a comic book and we brought in a bunch of characters that we knew and we brought in this character we've seen a couple times already this year and yeah it was i i'm glad they wrapped it up i guess but at this point and like i said we'll talk about specifics here in just a minute two of was, my favorite gene colon panels though from all of his Daredevil stuff are in uh -huh. issue 153 or 4. It's the one where it shows Cobra and Hyde for the first time. It's full page. And then there's one where him and Hyde end up going out the window. Yes. And I love both of those. I thought the art in, in that issue, I think it's probably 154, was 153. Yeah, was 153. Really fantastic. 153. Yes, the, yeah. the, 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 it's a full page of him shattered through a window and now falling from a 12th story uh, with, I think it's Cobra, if I remember right. Or no, it was Hyde. Hyde, Hyde, Hyde pushed him through the window and those two go falling down. And yeah, it is, it that, that was actually a really cool looking panel. Yes, definitely. All right, so the year ends with Daredevil experiencing mysterious headaches, which are causing him trouble with his radar sense. We also learn Deathstalker is working on a plan to get Daredevil. And it was so weird the way he showed up in this, by the way. He's just in an alley. Yes. Mur Murdoch has an episode with his headaches and, like, actually passes out for a little bit comes to and then leaves the alley and then suddenly out from behind like a dumpster or a trash can or something we see Deathstalker who says hmm he doesn't know what's coming for him I'm going to get him sort of thing and so it's just like it's so so weird <laughs> no, no comment so on that at all on the... No, you're you're one hundred percent right. I mean, the thing is that it's not just that, but then at the very end, the whole you know, he goes in and, and is threatening Black Widow and taking yes. on the Avengers, and I didn't I was, really I was, get why. I'm I'm lost on that. I, Can you explain I, that to me, Dwayne? I was uh, yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say so. At the storefront, Murdoch, uh, after he has this blackout and comes to, he ends up going to the storefront. He interviews and hires a new assistant. Ends up taking, supposedly taking her and Foggy Nelson out to dinner, but on the way learns that Black Widow is in town and the and is with the Avengers. So he bails on Becky Blake, the, the new assistant, and Foggy. And then as Daredevil, he invades Avengers Mansion, taking down the Beast and Captain America and calling out Black Widow saying she's she'll pay dearly. And it just... It was so disconnected. Like, he's at the beginning of the issue, he's having these headaches and blacking out. And then all of a sudden, by the end of the episode, he's Daredevil. He's beating up Captain America and Beast and, and, and threatening Black Widow. And they don't know what's going on either. They're like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> it was... I, I don't understand it at all. It didn't make any sense. There was no... There was no real line between, like, were we supposed to connect that these mysterious headaches had something to do with it? I, I, I guess, 
but but there was really no way of knowing because he he wasn't he just said he was having headaches and he was having problems as a result with his radar sense he wasn't like suddenly having a completely distant different personality and randomly attacking people but then suddenly he's a completely different personality and attacking people yeah and it's somehow got to do with the night stalker but i'm not exactly sure how night stalker did this to him because he normally like can kill people or whatever but so don't worry it'll all get sorted out and they'll be friends again soon enough but sure. i was wondering though if if you because no, I don't think without was, reading the next two books or so, you can you can understand. You, you no, you can't. You you really can't. And I will tell you that I was definitely very confused as I was reading this book. It did not make any sense. It was just craziness. You're that right. actually is. If I had a critique of this entire year, I don't think it mostly makes any sense. There are so many story elements that kind of drop and get picked up and it's almost like sometimes you get a book where one of the books gets a different artist and just tells another story hey now you know we're waiting for somebody to finish something so he's just going to fight Hyde for an issue and then we'll be back you know it it seems like and and i think this is part of just the problem that marvel has this year they are so behind schedule they have so few sort of grown-ups watching over things that everything's just a mess and it's a it's yeah. a miracle they get any books out anywhere near on time and so they've gone to to six uh a year part of that you know colin is still doing two madracular and stuff too so that every a lot of these guys have other books they're working on too so then they're doing fill-ins on these it's just a mess absolute mess so it looks like I inadvertently skipped the uh, Marvel 2-in-1. I'm just going to briefly mention that in the Marvel 2-in-1, on. Matt Murdock is called on to represent Ben Grimm as he's on trial for causing too much damage in New York. But it ends up leading to Daredevil briefly working for the Mad Thinker, some random villain who is out mm -hmm. to get Grimm. However, with the help of Vision and Yellow Jacket, they're able to take down the villain without too much problems. So that that was uh, his appearance in the Marvel 2 and one That kind of happened around the time of the uh, Maxwell Glenn, Heather Glenn saga, uh, and that sort of thing as well. So just, yep. just so you're aware of that. So as far as like, New powers, new toys. We mentioned it. The Billy Club got destroyed again in issue 153. But it made its return in issue 155 without any explanation whatsoever. It just magically, he had it and started using it. And we never find out how he was able to get it, get, get it back. So no, no. Black Widow, Black Widow's friend didn't make it for him. He didn't make it himself necessarily, or, or I guess maybe he did and just didn't bother mentioning it uh, in the book itself. Perhaps he's learned to just keep a spare or two on hand, which would not yeah. be a bad idea. Yeah. As far as new supporting characters, we had Ben Urich, who you mentioned as far as one of the bigger characters. He's a Daily Bugle reporter. He actually is the narrator for the start of issue 153. And so, and, and he ends up sort of kind of looking into if there's a connection between Matt Murdock and Daredevil. He, he's sort of picking at threads is, is what, what I would say he is, he's starting to do uh, a little bit in this he's like interesting i this is really weird i'm gonna be looking around here a little bit at this and and uh little does he know just how how right he actually is mm -hmm. we had becky blake who is murdoch's new assistant at the storefront because when heather glenn leaves she was kind of working as the assistant at the storefront Partially because it was her idea that, that Murdoch start the storefront and then Foggy comes in. 
And so he needs a, a new assistant. Becky Blake is actually in a wheelchair too, which I thought was actually great to see as well. So we have a little bit more kind of inclusion in the in the book as well. So we not only have a a, a blind hero, but we have a, a an administrative assistant working at the storefront who is in a wheelchair. And and she's like she even there was I think an instance and I think I think it was this year or maybe in into 1979 where like somebody's offering to like push her wheelchair and she's like no i i can do this i and and so it's like showing showing people that you know they're somebody with in a wheelchair is still very capable of functioning without your help is, is basically where i'm getting at and i i loved the fact that in a comic book, they're basically telling people that. Yes. Hopefully she's also strong enough to not fall from Matt Murdock, like everyone else does in this position. Un I, have my, I have my doubts, though. Unfortunately, <laughs> like within the first few panels of her being introduced, she uh, does sort of kind of be like swooning a little bit towards Matt Murdock, so... I don't know. There is something about the uh, the cologne that he wears, or something that is uh, rather entrancing to 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 the women that that come in contact with him. It's part of the job, uh, evidently. Yeah. So uh, in in that final issue of the year one fifty five, we see Beast, obviously the blue haired mutant uh, from the X Men. We we saw Captain America. We saw Hercules as well. Uh, we had not seen Hercules in a, in a Daredevil book before as well. And then as far as new villains, there really wasn't anybody. I, I, I mentioned the Paladin. He is a superhero looking for Kilgrave, but he wasn't really a villain. He was just another superhero looking for Kilgrave. He eventually ends up getting mind controlled by Kilgrave uh, in the big spotlight issue that we'll talk about. But he really wasn't, and they fought when they first met. But the, I, I find it hard to classify him as a villain. But maybe, maybe he is, insofar as he kind of is a villain that wasn't really a villain in these sets of books. What it? What well, he's is really more just somebody who's out for the money? Wasn't he going to get like a half million dollars for yeah. being in the Purple Man or whatever? So he's kind yeah. of like a, a gun a for hire hunter. type of thing, yeah. bunny, bony hunter. So. Either particularly good or particularly bad. It uh, depends on the day and the contract, I guess. Not nearly All as right. cool as uh, not nearly as cool as like Boba Fett, though. In case you were wondering, although yeah. looking at his helmet, I wonder if he is supposed to be Boba Fett. Actually, there was there was some similarities there, wasn't there? Just now that I think about it, yeah, that's yeah. that. All right. All right. Let's just what, not dig into that too deeply. So. Yeah. Let's, let's jump in and let's talk about the spotlight. This week's spotlight story. All right, Dwayne. Daredevil 154, September 1978, codename Arena. Here's your spotlight issue. Tell us a bit about this one and why you decided it was the one you wanted to talk about. Yes. This, so you've kind of been building to this throughout the through this year, as disjointed as it sort of was, we he, Daredevil is now captured, and we had this big final showdown with Kilgrave. So I felt like this this was sort of an over the top ending to not only this year, but there were elements of this story that you know, if you think about the Maxwell Glenn part of it, that started way back over a year ago. And so I, I felt like we needed to to spotlight this particular issue. So let, let me give you a recap as to what happens here. So with Daredevil captured, Kilgrave decides to put the Sightless Crusader in an arena with a quartet of his biggest and baddest foes. That is Mr. Hyde, the Cobra, Gladiator, and the Jester. He wishes for them to fight to the death for his entertainment and hopefully the death of Daredevil considering he's outnumbered. 
As the fighting commences, Daredevil fights them one after another and isn't having too much trouble, even if there's no break between the attacks. Help for Daredevil appears to arrive as the Paladin joins the party, but unlike Daredevil, Paladin is vulnerable to the Purple Man's control, which he does use to his advantage. Kilgrave forces the Paladin to target Daredevil with a blaster weapon rather than come after him, his actual target. Somehow, though, Paladin is able to overcome Kilgrave's control just enough to fire his blaster at Kilgrave rather than Daredevil, which stuns the surprised villain and frees him from the Purple Man's sway. Paladin then adjusts his armor so that he will not be controlled again. He puts actually down the Boba Fett helmet and is able to uh, not be mind controlled again. So as a last ditch effort to escape, Kilgrave threatens to shoot Heather Glenn if he's not allowed to escape while the Paladin stands down, not wanting the woman to get hurt. Daredevil takes the blaster from Paladin's hand and shoots the gun Kilgrave had to Glenn's head. That's right. A blind superhero shoots a blaster that hits the hand with a gun that's to his ex-girlfriend's head. Sure. Daredevil then chases Kilgrave to the top of a watchtower in an abandoned prison where the fight has been taking place. That's where this arena is being, is being held, where this big showdown is being held. When the Purple Man turns and attempts to fight, he misjudges the leap, Daredevil ducks, and Kilgrave flies over the edge and down a cliffside into a water, ending the showdown, presumably killing our villain, Or, but there's no body, so there you go. That is, that is your epic showdown. Uh, and conclusion of this big story arc with Kilgrave. It is definitely over the top. I mean, I was not expecting to see Jester. I wasn't expecting to see Kilgrave. I guess I finally figured out why Mr. Hyden Cobra are here. We had the Paladin come in. It's just this big five-on-one sort of thing, and yet Daredevil still manages to emerge victorious. And the other thing is, like, if you think about it, though, because of how long this story has gone on, we've had at least three different writers who have written part of this story to get us to this finale. Mm -hmm. So to, to say that it could have def definitely been a bit mis disjointed, uh, yeah. We had, I, I also wanted to highlight this issue because we did have the return of Gene Colan as part of this story. I We mentioned a couple of the panels the, the falling out of the window thing, that that was really cool. But I, I don't know if this was up there with some of the art that we saw from Gene Colan when he was on as the regular artist for for Daredevil. Still good, but not to Gene Colan level. So as a note, Gene Colan, the inker, is incredibly important too. I think, I think we talked about that back in the day. Steve Leolola is doing the inking on him. He is very young at this point. He's probably never inked Colin before. And I think most of it comes down to him doing almost more like just clean line art on Gene Colin. And that looks terrible. So I don't believe yeah. that this is bad Colin art. I believe it's Steve Leolola, who he ends up doing a lot of independent stuff in the 80s. I really liked him as a as a art artist um but in this book as an inker on colin i think it was poor 53 was different that was tony dezinica dezinica he's been around forever he's a great inker and so those panels i loved were done by dezinica in 153 they are night and day different yeah even though okay. same inker or same penciler colin but 153 the art looks a lot better than 154 Okay, so. that makes sense. It, I I sometimes forget that it's not just the artist, it's the anchor that can really make or break good 
good pencil work that's being done. And more with Colin than most, because he does this very almost almost like um, full shade sort of art when he does it. And depending on how the inker does things, it can be great or terrible, which is why Tom Palmer, who's his regular inker on a lot of stuff, uh, just makes his art shine and a lot of other stuff. Uh, it just doesn't really look that great. So I would agree sense. with you though. Once, once I didn't think about it that much, I'm just like, Oh, it's colon. But then when I go back and look at it after seeing that comment, I'm like, yeah, a lot of these panels, the, the art is just way simpler and less, less expressive and, yeah. and sort of, it doesn't, it doesn't have that moodiness that Gene Coleman yeah. normally has. But yeah. Well, right. well played, sir. And then lastly, it just, just to call out that the villain dies, but lives to fight yet another day. Or I'm assuming as much, because as I said, we didn't see a body fall, despite falling from ridiculous heights into water. I, I sort of feel like this isn't going to be the last time we see Kilgrave or, or the Purple Man. No, no, indeed. He's got some terrible things to do in, in coming years. He'll be back to tie together. Like the the start of your weekend, this just okay. just gonna throw at you. Did you okay. know who's supposed to be playing the Paladin in the Captain America movie potentially, or maybe Daredevil: Born Again TV show? I do not. Rumors are it's Giancarlo Esposito is going to be is, the he's Paladin. Gonna, he's gonna be the Paladin, huh? That's that, rumors. That's that's, could that's the rumor. Okay. So. He, he did. He did. He did say it's not someone you would expect. So uh, there you go. And and apparently it's supposed to end up being a TV series on on Disney Plus after his reveal. Sometime soon, he said, which I think has to mean the Dareda the Deadpool Wolverine movie. Uh, it's coming out at near the end of. Ju- July. So he'll be like a guest in that, and then maybe going to Born Again or something or like this. Or in the or in the uh, post credit scene or something like that. Yeah. Excellent. But yeah, yes. I don't I don't know that, but that that's been the rumor is that that could be the the character he's playing. So we will see. All right. With not, that, not exactly an A list character for him, but uh, you know, I'm sure he'll do good work with it. So yeah. All right, well, with that, why don't we close the book on Daredevil and let's talk about the takeaway for this week. This week's takeaway. All right, Dan, what is the takeaway for 1978? There, there's definitely been a lot to di- digest as far as what's going on in comics as a whole, at Marvel more specifically, obviously not even talking about DC and their, what's going on craziness there. What should we take away from, from from the year in comics for 1978? So you've also made me sit with this for three weeks. So now I've been pondering it. I've been navel-gazing on 1978 more than I have most. But one of the things that really has gotten me about 1978 is what I'm going to call the strange case of Jack Kirby. And essentially... As we get to 1978, one of the other things that happened was there was actually an antitrust lawsuit filed by a company called Urjax Enterprises, which was a comic book distribution company that was angry that Marvel and DC and some of the other publishers were essentially giving preferential treatment to the Seagate distribution system, and that because of that, the direct market was difficult for anybody else to get into, that Phil Sulik essentially had a monopoly. There was no way for Marvel and DC to really fight this, because once someone looked at it, it was obvious that that was (laughs) was what was going on. Sure. So they decided to open up the direct market to other publishers. And they saw this as a much easier, much more dependable way to get their products out to people uh, than using the newsstands and the returnable and all the other stuff they've been doing for decades. What's weird is that about this time, Jim Souter noticed something while going through the sales reports after taking over as an editor-in-chief. He noticed that 
as he was getting ready to cancel all of Jack Kirby's books, that if they were only looking at the direct market, Kirby's Marvel books were some of their most popular books. That they sold essentially something like 30,000 copies of all of Kirby's stuff to Seagate. Triple what most other Marvel titles sold through the direct market at that time. But really? on the newsstand, Kirby's stuff was their worst books as far as actually selling and sell through. So, wow. what you had, even at that point, was the beginning of this idea that even within the superhero genre, not taking into account Archie and all this other stuff, that direct market audience at comic stores had wildly different tastes than the general public, even in terms of what Marvel books they were going to buy. And as the direct market over the next decade or so continues to grow in importance, comic purchasing and their comic, therefore, sort of comic production begins to skew towards that specialized consumption of the direct market and, oh. unfortunately, away from mass market viability. So if they start making more and more books that are like Jack Kirby-type books to appeal to the direct market, those books are going to sell poorer and poorer. And what we do see is that we already have examples um, from what Ju Shooter was talking about in 78, of the fact that you can't just look at the direct market and the newsstand and say, well, basically stuff's going to sell the same, right? Right. Wildly different in terms of, of how that works. Which is why it's interesting that even now, Kirby is regarded as essentially a god within the comic industry, within the comic community, right? But when you give his art to newer fans or to younger fans, or people who me. haven't read comic even books. Even me, yeah, even me. What did you think of Jack Kirby's art when you first read it? I did not care for it. It just seemed like a mess on the page. Yeah. And I, it was it was hard to follow. It, it didn't make sense. It was, it, was, it was a tough read. Yep, and I think this is pretty normal, that those of us, like me, who've been here for decades and have had all of our sort of elders within the community tell us that Jack Kirby is the guy, right? Have learned yeah. to love him and have learned to read his stuff and the like and have seen enough people who've copied his style that he's, he's foundational. I almost think that Kirby ends up being sort of like jazz or, or like opera, right? Uh, he's, he's a Miles Davis type of person where if you really get into it and you learn to appreciate jazz... You will love Birth of the Cool. If you just want to listen to, you know, top 40 music, it's probably not going to do it for you, right? Mm. And Kirby is sort of this acquired taste developed through constant positive reinforcement. 1978 was a weird time because that had a number of TV shows featuring comic characters. You had the Superman movie come out and it did huge numbers. There were multiple new newspaper strips featuring Marvel and DC characters. Comics were becoming more visible than ever in other American media. You know, the newspapers, TV, movies, right? Right. But even as this was happening, that direct market channel for sales continued to sort of start skewing the market of comics so that while the market is out there for mass appeal sort of of more traditional American comics. Comic books are going to start getting darker. They're starting to get more sort of specialized towards that comic store audience. Uh -huh. And I think this is sort of that year where things start to get to a point where if comics had just really leaned into making the connections to popular culture we might have turned it around a little bit. Because the problem is that right now, as comics continue to move to the direct market, even things like Archie and Richie Rich that are trying to continue doing newsstand sales are going to have a harder and harder time because as more people go to the comic store to get their comics, that's less sales for the newsstands, which makes it less reasonable for them to keep selling the things, and you mm. just get the market kind of collapsing. Yeah. So, 
1978 was a time when you had things like Saber. You had, you know, heavy metal going into its second year. There's fantastic, independent, and sort of just above underground type comics coming out now where we're getting really creative stuff, really interesting stuff. I think this could have gone a different direction. But the direction we went just about tanks comics in the next few years. Because things get kind of bad in the late 70s and into the 80s, both for Marvel and DC, and then they have to find ways to turn around and see what they can do. It's interesting. This is about the time I got into comics. I had no idea what a mess it was. I just went I just went down to the newsstand and got my cloak and dagger comic books, right? I, I did not realize that the industry was on the precipice of disaster every month. But it appears that it was actually. So But that's my takeaway is that um that this is it, it's interesting to have seen data that actually shows how different the newsstand is from the direct market. And I think that's sort of where we maybe lost a generation of kids and of new readers, is that we we just moved away from them. So makes sense. There you go. Great takeaway for this week, Dan. Thank you. That's gonna put a wrap on this week's show. We'd like to thank you for joining us. If you're new to the podcast, please consider subscribing on your podcast player of choice. That way you'll get each new episode as soon as it's released. If you've already subscribed, we'd appreciate it if you'd share the show via social media or leave us a review. That will help new listeners find the show much easier. Whether you're new to the podcast or you've been with us from the beginning, we'd love to get your thoughts about this week's show. You can send those to us via email at comments at comicsovertime.com or via Twitter or Blue Sky. We're at Comics Overtime there. Until next week, take care, everybody.